In the 1980s, Japan experienced an unprecedented period of economic growth. The middle class flourished, and a new leisure class was emerging as well. At the same time, the manufacturing industry was producing new products, and consumers had more disposable income to buy them. Japanese tourists traveled around the world, enjoying the benefits of their newfound wealth. The country had better exports, technologies, it had a higher standard of living. Overall, in Japan, there was a sense of optimism and self-confidence. The country of Japan had arrived in the future, but eventually, like all good things, this period of shining prosperity would come to an end. The 1980s economic bubble in Japan would eventually collapse in 1992, but this moment on the precipice of a fall had a soundtrack, and it's a style of music we now call Japanese city pop. It's shiny, catchy, cinematic, and surprisingly complex. And with city pop compilations getting millions of views on YouTube, this genre is really having a moment. Just the sheer traffic that this music is able to produce on YouTube is bananas. Something is clearly happening. This might even be the YouTube wormhole that you find yourself in right now. If not, just by clicking on this video, you're gonna start getting surfaced some city pop compilations. I guarantee it. Watching this video will make that incoming wave of content a lot more enjoyable because you'll have some context and you'll know what you're listening for. And with city pop, things get a little weird. I mean, it's barely a genre even in the traditional sense. It's more of just an, an era of Japanese pop music. And even more strangely, it's probably more popular in Brooklyn now than in Osaka. City pop is confusing, but sorting it out is totally worth it, I promise. In this video, I'll show you how city pop became the genre we know today, how it came back from the dead, and why it's showing up in your recommended videos. My name is David, and this is your guide to city pop. As I was doing research for this video, I was really trying to figure out how and why city pop happened. Why is it so different from Japanese popular music before and also afterwards? But I think the question I really needed to start with was where? Well, obviously Japan, but more specifically, Japan's giant urban centers. Most importantly for our story, Yokohama, Osaka, and of course, Tokyo. Tokyo is the largest city in Japan, with its greater metropolitan area hosting a population of 40.8 million people. It's also the country's cultural and media hub. If you're going to make it big in the music industry in Japan, it'll almost certainly be in Tokyo. And this was as true in the 80s as it is now. But Tokyo, together with these other metropolitan areas, would form the stage in which the story of City Pop and its listeners would play out. And I would argue that this story can be traced back to just one album by a very important band. That's this album right here, Kazumachi Roman, by the Japanese folk rock band, Happy End. You might actually recognize track number three, Kazuo Otsumate, or Gather the Wind, if you've seen the film Lost in Translation. This album altered audience expectations for what Japanese popular music could and should be. And the members of Happy End would, each in their own way, change Japanese music forever. They've even been called the Japanese Beatles. I'm not sure if that's a good comparison, but in terms of influence, it definitely gets the point across. Now, before Happy End, there were a bunch of more traditional pop acts, broadly referred to as Kaiokyoku, and a bunch of rock groups who were emulating a bunch of different styles from the United States. And a lot of these popular rock acts would write and perform their music in English, or with limited use of the Japanese language. The question of whether rock should be performed in Japanese was a pretty serious debate and it's now known as the Japanese language rock controversy, which is a pretty good title, but a little on the nose if you ask me. For Kazumachi Roman, much like their first self-titled album, Happy End decided to sing entirely in Japanese, incorporating some influences from earlier pop music and a heaping dose of folk rock closeness. And because of its resounding success, the Japanese language rock controversy quickly fizzled out. Listeners would buy rock and roll records sung completely in Japanese. After Kazumachi Roman, the English version of a specific genre didn't have to become popular first like rock and roll had, and traditional music could be consulted but discarded if needed. If foreign sounds were borrowed, adapted, and interpolated, you could still have music that was more approachably Japanese, but also new and exotic without strict gatekeeping or genre-bound audience expectations. Happy End also did the best thing for the future of city pop that they possibly could have done. They broke up. The band members, now solo artists, continued in music, collaborated on and off, and individually appeared on some of the most classic city pop tracks ever recorded. 
It is not an exaggeration to say that this group of four guys built the sound of Japan in the 70s and 80s directly. They influenced the next wave of big artists, but they were also part of this wave themselves. In the mid to late 70s, this exciting new style exploded with bands like Sugar Babe and their 1975 album Songs, which incorporated jazzy chords and new influences. One member of Sugar Babe in particular would go on to become the so-called king of city pop, but we'll get back to him in just a second. But there's something else really interesting about this era of music, and it's not something I hear talked about too often. It's also there from the very beginning of city pop's origins. Let me show you. First, take a look at these albums. They were all recorded between 1975 and 1990. And even from the album artwork, you can work out that there's a common theme here. Japanese popular music wasn't just experimenting with American genre, but also American ideas of the good life, as well as subverting those ideas in some interesting ways. And in the States, the land of Yacht Rock, Jimmy Buffett, and earlier acts like Martin Denny, the beach was a big deal. This is the hallmark of a lot of city pop music, Exotica. Exotica. Music that employs rhythms, melodies, or instrumentation to evoke the exotic far-off or alien. This exoticism is a thread that runs right through the heart of city pop, usually including influences from Latin, Polynesian, and Caribbean music. An early classic from this period is an album called Pacific by Harumi Hosono, Shigeru Suzuki, and Tatsuro Yamashita. It's an absolute classic. Uh, one of those albums that's great from beginning to end. And it's really cool because you can hear city pop forming in real time. Great listen. I, I would totally recommend it. And I'm pretty sure that it's on Spotify and Apple Music. And by the way, those first two guys are former members of Happy End. And the third guy, Tatsuro Yamashita, would become the biggest name in the entire genre. It's, a, it's an absolutely perfect day. Can't complain about that. This right here is a synthesizer, and this is a drum machine. And well, obviously this is an electric guitar and electric bass, but these become the new implements of city pop. And these artists here become the stars of a new and more modern sound. Music made by city people for city people. That's how Japan Archival Series Supervisor Yosuke Kitasawa describes city pop. And in this era, you can really feel it. There's still plenty of the exoticism of the mid to late 70s, but there's also now a vibrant celebration of urban life. And this is also the era when the king of city pop, Tatsuro Yamashita, finally takes the throne. Tatsuro Yamashita released 1980's Ride on Time, which rocketed to the top of the Japanese charts, with songs being featured on commercials and TV shows. This album was a cultural treasure, but it was also dwarfed by Tatsuro's next album, and this may be the most popular and influential city pop album of the entire era. That album is 1982's For You, a funky and incredibly well-produced record, which grabs your attention from the very first track, the appropriately named Sparkle. I personally love this album and Ride On Time, they're both great, but whereas Ride On Time stayed at number one for a week, For You stayed there for an entire year. In this era, sounds got bigger, and stars became more famous and even idolized. But city pop itself was taking on new complexities in form and style. There was also some experimentation with theme. While the music itself usually remained optimistic, some artists were exploring some of the downsides of this overheated urban lifestyle. Themes like loneliness, heartbreak, inauthenticity. These all became appropriate topics for a city pop hit. Tatsuro Yamashita said of his writing that Broadly speaking, the main theme of my lyrics is the loneliness and isolation of city life. But even in the city, it still rains. The wind still blows. That's something I found in- Babu Akiki, Bubble Economy. It stumbled, then crashed. Stock prices were halved, incomes fell by 5%, the price of land collapsed, businesses became insolvent. What is known as the lost decade in Japan had begun. And just like that, the city pop sound started to disappear from Japanese music charts. Some of the biggest artists persisted, some by changing their sound, but the golden age was over. But don't get too sad, because city pop's story doesn't end here. Take a look at these videos, this subreddit. You may have heard this stuff chipping away at the edges of your awareness bubble. So many Western people on the internet today seem to have fallen in love with the genre. 
This is a surprising reemergence, considering that Japanese people of the 1980s were the main audience for this music. However, there are a few factors that make listening to city pop today an entirely different experience compared to 40 years ago in Tokyo, even though some of the reasons for enjoying it are the same. After a considerable amount of research, I think there are three fundamental reasons why this music is resonating so much with a younger audience online. The first reason is what I'm going to call nostalgia, comfort, and escapism. I don't really need to explain the nostalgia effect. You've already experienced it. You know, the warm glow of old photos, nice memories. And not to get too Alan Watts on you, but you can only really live in the present, which is harsh news, I know. But in some very non-literal ways, you can kind of escape to the past. Sure, you're not imagining it exactly how it was, and no golden age is a golden age for everybody, but you do feel something. And that something can be enough, even just for a moment, to help you escape the present. Young people in the West have it pretty good, but they also have a lot of valid and disheartening concerns. It's a lot harder to buy a house than it used to be. For a lot of people, prosperity feels out of reach, and it's definitely less comfortable to support an entire family on a single income. The prosperity of 1980s Japan and the optimism of city pop provide a perfect foil for these anxieties. Just check out the tone of some of these comments that I found on city pop compilations. A lot of these are kind of nice, but a lot of them are kind of depressing too. I mean, it seems like they focus on a nostalgic melancholy for a better future, or at least a time when it seemed like things would just keep getting better. And the second reason I think that city pop is having such a resurgence is the YouTube algorithm and internet core. Genres of music that are made for audiences on the internet, often on YouTube. With the rise of lo-fi hip-hop, vaporwave, and other internet-only genres of music, something interesting is happening. It's like the opposite of album-oriented rock. There are tons of semi-anonymous artists that are putting out heaps of stylistically really similar music, all with the goal of capturing a certain aesthetic or vibe. And also something they have in common is they're usually meant to, not always, but often to be put on in the background, kind of like smooth jazz for Gen Z's and millennials. Japanese city pop is one of these internet music wormholes. It's popular, it's effective at what it does, and the algorithm might try it out on you if it hasn't already. It also meshes conveniently well with the Japan-obsessed youth subculture in the West who already enjoy Japanese movies and TV shows, video games, etc. And the third reason that I think people are really digging city pop again is that it's good music. It's funky, it's catchy, and one of the most interesting things about it is that it's way more complex than it needs to be. I mean, it's the music of Japanese consumerism in the 80s, right? Hits show up in all sorts of TV commercials and radio ads. You just think it might be simpler, less cinematic or jazzy. There's all these complicated chord progressions and great harmonies and lush horn arrangements. I don't know, I just haven't squared it yet, but it's very cool, I don't understand what's going on there. But in sum for point three, it's an era that produced a lot of great music. There was a scene going on, a web of collaborations. It's a genre that continuously changed and refined itself. I think that makes it interesting and enjoyable to listen to, at least for me. Okay, here's a selection of seven of my favorite city pop albums. So you have one for each day of the week. If you're a city pop head, then you know that these aren't super deep cuts, but that's okay, because these are great entry points to the era and the genre. Here they are in no particular order, Firstly, For You by Tatsuro Yamashita. Listen to Sparkle, Morning Glory, and the fantastic Hey Reporter. Secondly, Timely by Anri. Two songs I really like off this album are Windy Summer and of course, I Can't Stop the Loneliness. Number three is Toshiki Kodamatsu's After Five Clash. Number four, Taiko Onuki Sunshower. Number five, Awakening by Hiroshi Sato. The last track, Say Goodbye, is really cool. It sounds like a mix between Daft Punk and the Beach Boys or something like that. For number six, we have Full Moon by Junko Yagami. And number seven, A Long Vacation by Ichi Otaki. This is one of my favorite city pop albums of all time. I would check out the songs Kimiwa Ten and Shoku and Ame no Wednesday. Now, I, I know that was a lot to untangle, so if you made it this far, Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming around. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll be back with some more music stuff soon. But for now, I'm going to head to the beach, maybe have a few pina coladas, 
and listen to some Masayoshi Takanaka. Cheers.